insects and we saw that the trachea or the tracheoles or the trachea together with that system it is the gas exchange apparatus in the insects okay where we saw that it opens through the spiracle okay and then it goes deep in the track this is the trachea and then the trachea terminates into very small tracheoles and these small tracheoles we said that they are the ones that make direct connections with the body tissues that do require oxygen and that do give out carbon dioxide so these are the body tissues mm -hmm. and we agreed that in these tracheoles on these tracheal tubes we have there a tissue fluid okay that keeps on fluctuating increasing and decreasing okay in these tubes basing on the need at that point whereby if oxygen is and we are going to talk about gas exchange okay so it is that fluid which performs some important part as far as gas exchange is concerned then we also talked about that actually these insects do not transport their respiratory gases through blood and so that's why their blood does not have hemoglobin okay and so we agreed that it is this system of tubes okay that does transport materials so that does transport these respiratory gases to and away okay from the tissues so basically that's where we stopped in our previous lesson and in today's lesson then we are free to talk about the gas exchange in insects and see how actually the process occurs so like i've said today's lesson we are going to talk about the gas exchange in insects and actually see okay how the process occurs <coughs> So gas exchange occurs by inhalation and from this GIF you can have a look that you have the spiracles in the thoracic segments okay you have the spiracles here spiracles spiracles and so there are these spiracles in the thoracic segment that do open hmm? they do open up and then air enters and the air distributes itself throughout the entire body of the organism you can have a look how this tracheal system how these tracheal tubes they do distribute throughout the entire body so it's because of this that this organism doesn't require a transport system hmm? the system distributes so they open up open up they are controlled their opening and closure is controlled by a spiral valve of course so it is done which opens up and then air enters that's inhalation and now air distributes okay the, these structure tubes distributes this air throughout the entire body and then when this blood uh, sorry when this air reaches the tissues it collects the carbon dioxide now that is the red you are seeing and then the carbon dioxide is given out through the abdominal spiracles so the spiracles on the abdominal segments now what controls like we agreed it is pressure changes okay that occur within this organism's body like all the time there shouldn't just be 
in out in out at all no they are controlled <coughs> okay and so when this insect is under a high state of activity okay it needs too much oxygen okay why oxygen because the muscles will undergo respiration to produce carbon dioxide okay and so within the tissues okay within the tissues there there will be an increased level of carbon dioxide and so within these tissues you have their chemoreceptors that can detect the increased levels of carbon dioxide within the tissues and so as a result the chemoreceptors they will stimulate the abdominal muscles to relax okay and so why are you relaxing you are relaxing so that the volume of this insect inside increases and so if volume increases then what happens to pressure the pressure is going to decrease below the atmospheric pressure okay and the relaxation of these abdominal abdominal muscles causes the spiral valve the valve here that closes the spiracles to open up okay and due to pressure differences and remember the 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 the, the, the spiracle is open and the pressure inside is low compared to the pressure outside then air is going to be freely drawn into the trachea through the spiracles okay so the spiracle is going to open like how you can have a look at this and air is drawn into the spiracles into the trachea system now the air it will pass through the system of tubes okay through out to this trachea system okay and it will find this tissue fluid within this system within these tubes these tracheas you have there a system you have there a tissue fluid that now the oxygen okay it will dissolve in that tissue fluid okay and because there is a high concentration eh? because of accumulation of lactic acid in these tissues then the tissues will be highly the, the, the osmotic potential in these tissues is going to be so high that the tissue fluid together with the dissolved oxygen they will be drawn towards the tissues like how you can see this okay and so there are fine the tissues due to the concentration gradient of oxygen where it will be high in this tissue fluid that is in the tracheal and very low in the respiring tissues like how you can see then the oxygen is going to freely diffuse from the tracheal tubes from this tissue fluid into the tissues and in turn because the tissues have more carbon dioxide then the carbon dioxide is going to also diffuse in an opposite direction okay to where to this tissue fluid not so and so if that happens then we shall say that gas exchange has occurred so the spiracles will then cross and oxygen is forced along the tracheal system into the fluid filled tracheals that are in direct contact with the tissues and so the fluid is going then going to be drawn to the tissues because the tissues will be highly concentrated okay and then that fluid together with oxygen rich in oxygen when the oxygen reaches in the tissues then exchange is going to occur okay 
So gas exchange occurs along the concentration gradient between the tissues and then the fluid in the tracheoles. And so the insect will obtain its oxygen with such is okay with the such is so in that way you don't need a transport system because these tubes they are actually more efficient i believe i believe they are more efficient hmm? than our transport system because for them they transport they perform just one function gas exchange and they do transport oxygen directly to the tissues and carbon dioxide directly away from the tissues so nothing like dissolves no, no that, that one doesn't occur it doesn't really occur like that so now that is inhalation now how about exhalation how about when our insect wants to take out the gases hmm? it has taken in oxygen okay so now the gas it has to expel out the gases okay so for you to expel out the air still it is now the opposite it is antagonistic it's antagonistic compared to so the, the muscles the abdominal muscles obviously must contract okay and if they contract then they flatten the insect's body okay so if previously they relaxed and the insect was hmm, bulged was that then this time round they are going to contract and you know the concept is simple this concept is going to help you also in locomotion. When a muscle contracts, it shortens and becomes stiff. When a muscle relaxes, should I say it snackens, it lengthens and becomes... Hmm? So it loosens. Yeah, actually that's the good word. It loosens. So, also these ones, for you to expel air, then pressure differences. The pressure inside the insect's body must be higher than the atmospheric pressure. Okay? It depends on the positive pressure, on the atmospheric pressure. So that this air is pushed outside the insect's body so how is it going to be achieved the abdominal muscles the muscles okay that the abdominal muscles they are going to contract okay and if they contract obviously they become short and stiff and so the insect's body the whole body is going to flatten and so when it flattens then what will happen to the volume? The volume is going to increase. And you know from primary, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Okay? When pressure increases, then the volume decreases. Whose law is this? Is it Boyle's law? You can find out. When pressure increases, then the volume decreases. I think it's Charles Cicero, not boy. And when volume increases, then pressure decreases. So, similarly, when you flatten, then the volume is going to decrease and the pressure is going to increase within the tracheal tubes. Okay? Yes. And so what will happen? And remember, you've, you've taken in oxygen, enough of it, the lactic acid that had accumulated it will be broken down okay and the carbon dioxide that had accumulated within these tissues it also it will, it will reduce so what does that mean the osmotic potential of these tissue of these tissues 
tissue cells these cells okay is going to decrease and so if that if the osmotic potential decreases then it means more tissue fluid will diffuse from these tissues into the tracheal tubes into the tracheal tubes you can have a look into the tracheal tubes okay and so what does that mean the tissue fluid is going to accumulate is going to increase in size within this tissue fluid these tracheal tubes and what does that imply you'll be drawing this carbon dioxide closer to the trachea closer to the spiracle okay and what does that mean then the spiracle valve should therefore open and then you draw air outside to prepare for the next inhalation hmm? is that is that good yes. so due to the, the the increase in pressure the increased metabolism increases lactic acid and then lowers the water potential of the tissue fluid okay lowers the water potential of this tissue fluid and then at rest the water potential of the tissue fluid increases now when this is when inactivity we talked about this when it is inactivity okay there is accumulation of lactic acid we talked about this and then the water potential of the tissue fluid increases and so this fluid is drawn closer to the tissues but at rest the water potential of this tissue fluid Hmm? of these tissues is going to increase and so the ability at which they are going to give out this water to this to these tubes okay these tubes these tubes is going to be high and so this tissue fluid is going to accumulate within these tracheal tubes and so when water fills the tracheal tubes then what does that mean the carbon dioxide is going to be drawn Rosa to the spiracles and then the spiracle valves opens because the same contraction okay of 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 the abdominal muscles okay it leads to opening okay of the spiracle so the spiracle valves will open and then this carbon dioxide is pushed out okay of the insect's body and so with continue if the process occurs continuously continue you end up the insect will be supplied with enough oxygen and the carbon dioxide is going to be released out of the insect's body so let's see now we have seen that insects they actually do use the trachea spiracles blah blah and stuff like that to take in gases and this one is specific with uh, mm, with terrestrial insects because it is it's that air that is able okay to, to freely enter through the spiracles and then out through the spiracles <laughs> how about these insects that are aquatic hmm? that do inhabit hmm? insects that live in water how how do they survive how are they able to carry out their gas exchange okay yes and i can see you can ha you have this so you can identify okay hmm? this is not just for formality so let's have a look let's see how these insects, these aquatic insects, do carry out. So, aquatic insects too, they need oxygen to survive, to carry out gas exchange, and they also entirely depend on the tracheal tubes. 
on the tracheal system. Okay? That actually supplies oxygen, that supplies entire oxygen to the insect's body. But the mode of obtaining oxygen, okay, is the one that varies. Okay? From insect to insect to insect. And number one, we can talk about some insect therapy, okay, like those of mosquitoes. Now for them, they have a siphon. A siphon is a sucking tube, okay? It's a sucking tube. So that siphon, it is the one which is connected to the tracheal system, okay? And they just penetrate it up the water surface. If this is water, it will just penetrate through to the surface, okay? To the surface air, okay? This, so this is normal air. So they will just penetrate it through the water surface, okay? And since it will have some air in, some opening, then it is this siphon that will allow air to enter directly through this siphon and then connects to the tracheal tubes and distributes that air throughout the entire body. Similarly, when the organism wants to dispose of some carbon dioxide, it will be the same. The carbon dioxide will collect from the tracheal tubes and the whole of it, instead of collecting the spiracles, because in P1, P3, we were told that when you put an insect and you put there the abdomen, eh, they used to draw this, and then this is water. And the abdomen is down, and then they draw another insect. So if you studied primary in a good kindergarten, you remember this. And then this is the abdomen, and then this one is a mass. That when you mass which insect, which insect is going to die, and then they put A, and they put B. And they told us that insect B is the one which is going to die. Why? Because the spiracles are fully, <coughs> they are found on the thorax and the abdomen. But they told us that they are, they are found on the abdomen. Nobody told us about thorax. Sir. Yes? Mm -hmm. hey, you do, you're not getting what I'm drawing, eh? So, I don't know what was wrong, but anyway, it's okay. I was sharing the screen. So, I was still telling you that in primary, I was reminding you that primary question where you have your two insects and one is muzzled in water, okay? And it is the abdomen that is muzzled, okay? And then another one, it is the head that is muzzled. And then they asked which insect is going to die, okay? And they told us that insect A, the one whose abdomen is muzzled, and insect B will survive. And the answer was that they have spiracles on the abdomen and they are spiracles that do extract oxygen. Now, the spiracles do extract oxygen from air, not water. So therefore, when you put these insects in water, they will also suffocate because they won't be able to obtain the oxygen from the water. So they must have those aquatic insects, therefore, must have some modified structures to be able to survive in water. And so some of them, they do have that siphon, okay? That breathing tube, okay? That is able to extract oxygen, okay? From air. They just penetrate it through the surface of the water into air. And then they extract oxygen from air and carbon dioxide is going to be released out from the same siphon. Then we have other insects. Some insects, 
which can submerge for long time, they do carry oxygen in an air bubble. Okay? They now for these ones, they they do take in air in excess. Okay? Well they you swallow an air bubble. You know when you observe through water, you can see some air particles. <coughs> you see air bubble. So these insects what they do, they swallow okay too much air in the form of air bubble. And so they depend on that air. But they obviously have to come back and take air again and then go back. Because they will use that air and it gets depleted. Then some have spiracles at the tip of spines where they pierce the leaves underwater to obtain the oxygen that is produced by photosynthesis. So this is really a survival skill. Okay? Now this insect is going to pierce into the leaf hmm? and obtain that oxygen that is directly produced. Okay? By the leaf. And maybe gets rid of carbon dioxide. So it's like a two-way importance. This one benefits and the other one also benefits. But fi finally, some have external gills, like this insect that we are seeing. Okay? It has external gills. And what do gills do? They do extract oxygen, okay, from the water. Now, this one can live in its water for as long as it wants. Okay? And by the way, if it doesn't even have spiracles, then it cannot move out. It will be strictly an aquatic insect. Because an organism that breathes through gills cannot afford to stay on land. Unless otherwise. Then, so basically that's how simple gas exchange in insects is. So basically that's gas exchange in insects and let's now talk about gas exchange in frogs and toads. Now <clears throat> you know we have the frogs they do undergo they are really too confusing. It's like insects. <laughs> this is just for fun. Imagine you look at the insect when it is still an egg and be like man when are you becoming an insect and then it be like you wait for me when I'm a lava so you totally become confused when it's a lava and they tell you that this caterpillar is going to become a butterfly and you be confused so also with these ones the toads also they are kind of confusing that the young toads okay we well, can call them tadpoles they have a tail okay but the mature one does not have okay the mature ones do not have okay a tail but they are all toads the young toads actually they, they do have external gills, okay, external gills, external gills, and they breathe through these gills, but the mature ones do not have external gills. So unlike you, for these ones, they will continue confusing you until you learn how to mind your business, okay? So similarly, the gas exchange in tadpoles is through external gills. Period. These ones, they do obtain their oxygen through these gills. Okay? They are, they are entirely living in water. Entirely they live in water. Okay? 
and so you must have a mechanism that is enough to extract oxygen from water that is dissolved in water otherwise if you cannot if you don't have that mechanism then there is no way how you can survive in such an aquatic environment so therefore these young tadpoles these young toads they do have external gills which do extract oxygen from the water and the science is simple because in the water you have more dissolved oxygen okay than what is in blood that is saturating through these gills okay and because these gills are highly permeable hmm? highly permeable moist and thin eh? you remember adaptations of gas respiratory surfaces nothing has changed all of them have similar traits similar characteristics all gas respiratory surfaces have same respiratory surfaces so these external gills they are integuments that protrude outwards okay whereby they are thin slender thin very many numerous and highly moist and highly permeable okay and so because of oxygen differences between the surrounding water and the blood that is saturating through these gills then oxygen is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient from the surrounding water into the external gills and then carbon dioxide it will diffuse out okay from the gills to the water and then inside the oxygen will combine obviously will cross the red blood cells and then combine with hemoglobin to form with, to form oxyhemoglobin and then oxyhemoglobin will be taken to the respiring tissues for respiration because this one also needs energy it needs energy okay actually this so active so active than a mature frog so the rate at which it needs energy is so high that's why it has these external gills to extract enough oxygen to render this organism so active if I send you right now to get for me a new tea, it becomes you cannot get one unless you employ you employ some sophisticated means. So active. Okay? So where does it get that energy from? From a high metabolic rate. And you know metabolism. It's aerobic that produces enough energy. So you must supply the body with enough oxygen. Good we have we studied respiration, you know. Okay? You must supply your body with enough oxygen. And so what does that imply? Then you should have enough gas exchange apparatus to meet your energy demand. And so when respiration occurs, then this <coughs> then this organism is going to produce, sorry for that, it's going to produce carbon dioxide. And so in the tissues, you have more carbon dioxide there than the oxygen. So the carbon dioxide will, dis will, will diffuse from the tissues into the blood of this organism down its concentration gradient and so as a result the carbon dioxide will be taken from the tissues to the gills okay where it diffuses out down its concentration gradient and the organism obtains its air now those are the third poles the young toads. Now, how about the mature ones? The mature ones have three modes of obtaining the air. 
three ways. Imagine one, two, three ways. So unique. For you, how many do you have? If we cross your your your, your nozzle pipes, we cut off the track here somewhere. Do you survive? Obviously no. But for this mature toad, it has three modes. Three ways of obtaining oxygen and depending on the need of oxygen at that particular moment. For example, imagine if a toad is, uh, is hibernating, too hot or too cold, hibernating. You must cut off all non vital physiology activities, and in this case, breathing is one of them for a toad. So it cuts off all those other activities and then the skin now takes the control. Okay? The air is taken inside through skin. So you can call it the cutaneous respiration. How about when the organism is basically under some state of activity? Then the demand for oxygen will be so high that some mechanism must be improved. Okay? And which mechanisms? Now you, 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 you're going to use the lungs. Okay? And you're going to use the buccal cavity. Buccal means hmm, the pharynx. That space. Hmm, that mouth cavity. So you're going to use that mouth cavity. But these ones they are used concurrently. Okay? They are used concurrently. So do you see you 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 have a look at this as the aspect of evolution. Look at gas exchange as the aspect of evolution. Hmm? In that aspect. Look at fish. Though we haven't talked about fish. Look at amphibians. We haven't talked about amphibians. Look at. Mm, look at. Okay, look at these other organisms. They, 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 those invertebrates that inhabit in water. But for example, fish. Okay? And amphibians. What is varying? In fish, you don't have there any rungs apart from a rung fish. Okay? But now for this one, you have some rungs. Okay? But you see, like I told you, the rung lacks concurrently with the buccal cavity. Okay? So what does that show to you? What does it show to you? It shows that the nang is not yet developed compared to other high organisms. Okay? So it shows some aspect of evolution. Okay? Yes. So the lining, the adaptations, all the same. Why skin? All the same. Moist. Dense network of capillaries. Mm, highly permeable. All the same, okay? It's a respiratory surface. Buccal cavity, same moist, dense network of capillaries. Highly permeable to gases. You want the numerous? So all the same, okay? So let's see. The cutaneous respiration, use of the skin. Like I told you, if this is your toad, if this is your organism and this is the skin okay the skin is in direct contact with the air and air is rich in oxygen and the skin is also protecting the inside so you can have this hmm? look at this this is basically the underlying structures of the skin okay where you have the epithelium 
okay you can have this and then these are the invaginations the glands and the glands here are not participating anything as far as gas exchange is concerned and then within this tissue okay then you have their capillaries very many of them okay very many of them and the distance from this from these capillaries to the outside air is minimal that it's enough for gases to simply diffuse first of all they first dissolve in the moist lining of the skin to dissolve in the air to enhance the rate of diffusion and then after dissolving in the air then air is going to simply diffuse okay until when it reaches the capillaries and then the carbon dioxide that is rich it will simply diffuse from the capillaries down its concentration gradient to the surrounding air and you have obtained your gases that's simple how oh, i wish we can also simplify things like this hmm? you just have hmm, your skin you just undress and you take in air and you take out carbon dioxide but there are challenges associated with that that's why for you can inhabit in even in deserts on top of mountains anywhere even where you are, but are you seeing any thought around you? Are you seeing any thought in deserts? It's not because it doesn't want it, but it is restricted. The features it possesses restricted. So everything that has an advantage also has a disadvantage. Okay? Yes. So the skin, <coughs> oxygen is more concentrated in external air. Okay, inside that. So it will dissolve in the mucus on the skin surface and diffuses via the moist, thin, and permeable skin to the dense network of blood capillaries. And so when it reaches the blood capillaries, obviously, it will dissolve in the, to pass through the red blood cells. And then dissolve where? In the hemoglobin. Then when you dissolve in the hemoglobin, you form the hemoglobin, <coughs> and then taken by transport. Okay? To the respiring tissues for cellular respiration. And remember these ones have double saturation. Okay? However, it's incomplete. So you have incomplete double saturation. Whereby from the skin the air goes back to the heart. And then from the heart the air proceeds to the tissue. And then from the tissues, air back to the heart. And then from the heart to these structures where they will obtain the air. So that's double saturation. But it is incomplete. Find out. The heart has three chambers. So the air, so that blood, the blood rich in oxygen and the blood rich in carbon dioxide are partially separated. So there is some mixing. But that is transport. Okay? But this, like I told you, these barrier topics work concurrently. They don't work in isolation. Then carbon dioxide from the tissues, obviously, it will diffuse from the blood capillaries to the external medium via the skin to the atmosphere. And then you pass out that air. You get rid of carbon dioxide from blood. Can I receive some questions? The buccal cavity. So let's see how buccal cavity respiration occurs. So now the buccal cavity is that I can call it mouth cavity. 
if I want to simplify things, if I want to be as simple as possible. And like we told you, well, like we agreed, no, we didn't tell you, but we agreed that breathing in and out is due to pressure changes. Okay? Pressure changes. And what creates the pressure changes? It is moving, movement in and out. Okay? Up and down. For now, for this case, it's the lower jaw that is flexible. Even yours, it's the lower jaw that moves. The upper jaw is rigid. Now you are, you are trying to touch. You are trying to touch. It is the lower jaw that moves, okay? Up and down. The upper jaw is rigid. So even here, it's the movement of this lower jaw, okay? Up and down that creates changes in pressure within the buccal cavity. within the buccal cavity which allow now the pressure changes in the buccal cavity it is the one that allows air to draw into the buccal cavity and draw out the buccal cavity now what determines the movement of the flow of the buccal cavity this lower jaw they are the muscles that suspend it. Now, you can see these ones. These are the sternhoid muscles. Okay? They do suspend this lower jaw to the clavicles, eh? to the pectrogidus, you can see. Eh? On the shoulders, this lower jaw, this muscle, it is attached on the lower jaw, okay? And attached on the pectoral giddles. Okay? Now this one, the petrohoid muscles, this one, they are attached also on the lower jaw. Okay? And on the upper side. Okay? So now, like I told you, the concept is the same. These muscles, they are antagonistic. When one muscle contracts, another one relaxes. Okay? Now, when a muscle contracts, it shortens and becomes stiff. When a muscle relaxes, it loosens and elongates. Not so? It loosens and elongates. So what does that mean? These muscles, their contraction and relaxation is antagonistic. When this one contracts, then this one must relax. So this one, if it contracts, it will shorten. Eh? It's like pulling. Remember, this side is attached on some stiff, eh? the pelvic girdle. But on the jaw, for it, it's movable. The lower jaw is movable. So when you contract, you stiffen. Instead of pulling this side, you pull the lower jaw. So therefore, this one must relax, okay? So that now that when it relaxes, it elongates, and the lower jaw moves, okay? Downwards, you can have a look. But when the petrohoid muscle contracts, you can have a look, okay? Same concept, muscle contracts, it stiffens and shortens. Muscle relaxes, it loosens, and elongates or lengthens. So this one will contract, okay? It shortens, but it because it's attached to a flexible lower jaw, then this one relaxes, elongates. So this one is going to be pulled upwards. Okay? So now this movement of the lower jaw up and down it creates pressure differences within the buccal cavity vis-a-vis -vis the atmospheric pressure. Now there are those pressure differences 
that will either let air in or let air out. Okay? Brilliant. Let's see what happens during inhalation. Now, during inhalation, air moves in. Hmm? Air is moving in from the atmosphere to the buccal cavity. That's inhalation. Inhaling. So what does that mean? The pressure, the atmospheric pressure, must be higher than the pressure in the buccal cavity. So how is it achieved? Number one, during inhalation, the mouth and the glottis, they will close. This mouth and the glottis. Now, the glottis, it is some valve that controls the opening and closure of the trachea. It's here. Okay? Somewhere here. It is. And uh, it's a valve that controls the opening and closure of the trachea. So when you want to inhale, you, the mouth, together with the glottis, they are going to close. And then the nostrils, they open. Okay? The nostrils, they open. And then, what happens? The sternoid muscles, these ones, the ones which attached on the lower jaw, and they suspend the lower jaw, they are suspended onto the pectoral guido. They will contract, and then the petrohoid muscles, they will relax. But remember, the mouth is closed. And so what will happen? The flow of the buccal cavity, this side here, here, it will be pulled to move downwards. Okay? It will be pulled to move downwards. Remember the upper is rigid. Everything happens. It is the flow. This. It moves downwards. That's why when you observe a toad, you look at this, the flow. It's, it's kind of like bubbling, 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 bubbling. Okay? So the flow moves downwards. Now when the flow moves downwards, the volume in the buccal cavity, hmm? yes, yes. the volume, mm -hmm. the flow, I think this is, is it, I think it is O, it's O, double O, R. So the flow of the buccal cavity is lowered, and so when it is lowered, what happens to the volume? The volume in the buccal cavity is going to increase. And like we said, pressure and volume is antagonistic. When pressure increases, volume decreases. Actually, it is volume which affects pressure. So when volume increases, pressure decreases. When volume decreases, pressure increases. So the volume of the buccal cavity is going to increase. And the pressure in the buccal cavity is going to decrease below the atmospheric pressure. And so, air is going to draw from the atmosphere through the nostrils into the buccal cavity. Okay? And no, now what happens? Since it is just the buccal, now, like we said, you have a dense network of capillaries within the buccal cavity and it's, it is well moist and it is highly permeable to gases. So what does it imply? It implies that there are oxygen. It will freely diffuse from this oxygen rich air that has in, that has been inhaled into the buccal cavity through this buccal pharyngeal into the dense network of capillaries. Okay? Under the skin. 
and carbon dioxide too okay it will diffuse out into this air of course are we together and then the air that has been that has filled the capillaries under the skin it will be taken to the heart and then pumped to the respiring tissue in the tissues then the carbon dioxide because it's too much it will diffuse from the tissues to break down its concentration gradient okay and then taken back here where it will diffuse into the buccal cavity and it is as simple as that and this organism will inhale okay it will be able to obtain its oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide from the body through this buccal cavity now with exhalation in the buccal cavity air is pushed now this organism is really funny now you've drawn some oxygen away from this air and you've added some carbon dioxide now the same air is going to be pushed to the lungs can you imagine it's just confusion but that's how primitive this organism is okay that's why it is even slow it's not that active okay compared to others so the same air and exhalation it is going to be pushed to the lungs so what happens the mouth is still closed okay and the growth is, is going to open up okay and then the petrohoid muscle these ones these ones they you will contract and the sternoid muscles this one they will relax so the flow of the buccal cavity is pulled upwards okay reducing the volume now that is the other issue of negative pressure so when it is pulled upwards okay the volume in the buccal cavity is going to reduce and the pressure is going to increase slightly above the atmospheric pressure so this air tends to go back but the nostril will now be closed and the mouth will be closed and the glottis will be open so air is going to draw into the lungs air is going to fill the lungs okay so from the buccal cavity is raised uh -huh. the volume reduces and pressure increases then the glottis opens and remember the nostril is now closed and the mouth is closed Okay, so air leaves the buccal cavity into the lungs, where exchange occurs. Okay, and the usual exchange: oxygen diffuses out of the air in the lungs and fills the capillaries. Okay, and carbon dioxide diffuses in the reverse. So basically, it's as simple as that. So now with pulmonary saturation this one involves use of the lungs okay not saturation but respiration okay so where now the air that has been drawn into the lungs okay by inspiration the process is the same as exhalation from the buccal cavity there is nothing different mouth and nostrils remain closed while growth is opens and the petroid muscles contract and the sternoid muscles relax the flow of the buccal cavity is raised and then volume decreases pressure increases and air moves from the buccal cavity to the lungs we talked about this eh? there is nothing unique here and so when air fills the lungs okay then exchange occurs where Air leaves, oxygen leaves the lungs and fills the capillaries <coughs> down its concentration gradient, crosses the, the red blood cells, the membrane, 
okay and then after crossing the membrane then into the cytoplasm where you find their hemoglobin combined with the hemoglobin okay to form the hemoglobin and then transported throughout the entire body then to the tissues carbon dioxide will be high so it also diffuses down its concentration gradient to blood try to combine with hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin and then transported to the lungs to the skin and to the buccal cavity where in the lungs specifically it will diffuse into the lungs and then exhalation occurs okay and with exhalation it is just the reverse just the reverse of inhalation so what happens with exhalation the flow of the buccal cavity is lowered as usual due to the contraction and relaxation of the muscles which muscles the sternoid they contract and the petrohoid they relax so that you pull the flow of the buccal cavity downwards okay so what will happen the volume in the buccal cavity is going to increase and the pressure is going to decrease okay and so what happens the volume increases past that of the lungs but still the mouth will remain closed and the nostril also will remain closed why because when you open the nostrils air will tend to go back from atmosphere but you want to first expel out the air in the lungs so therefore air will move from the lungs and fill the buccal cavity and then now the growth is closes and the nostril opens and then the petrohoid muscle contracts and the sternoid relaxes to pull this lower jaw hmm? this lower then the flow of the buccal cavity is going to be raised then the volume decreases like how you can see okay pressure increases and you push remember this one is closed so it can't go back so you will push this air out of the nostrils into the atmosphere and the cycle continues not so and the cycle continues as simple as that so you can meditate about that okay so prepare meditate about this see volume changes pressure changes think about it yeah? so that it becomes part of you hmm? <laughs> like the other example i gave you movement move you move from high pressure to low pressure like the other example i gave you let me still repeat it i was fetching water and i was using a tube why connected the end to the pipe and one end to the jerry can so after my jerry can filled up i just went and removed the top end and the top end just fell down eh? normal like fell down normal and then from nowhere I saw water running out, okay, and me I just ignored. I was like maybe that was water that remained within the tube. And then I waited as I was trying to do this to reach my jerry can. It was almost empty, and then I was like, what? But to realize the jerrican was on some raised part compared to the tube that fell down. And so the pressure in the jerrican was always high than the pressure towards this end. 
so what I will continue was reflect. No force, no nothing, no nothing. Okay, no nothing. So the same applies to this. For you to move air from region A to region B, I don't mean this region, but just two regions, region A to region B, then pressure in region A must be high than pressure in region B. And remember, pressure and volume, they are inversely proportional. When volume increases, pressure decreases. When pressure, when volume decreases, then pressure decreases. If those concepts become part of you, trust me, respiration, gas exchange, it is going to be easy because that's, that is the principle that we base on to explain everything, all gas exchange mechanisms among all organisms. So otherwise, have a nice time.